Okay, we are pleased to be joined by Sal Capaccio, perhaps the most trusted source for your word on the street about the Bills and Buffalo sports. A sideline reporter for nine years now, Sal. I got uh, on your 10 now, yeah. Awesome. Uh, can be heard regularly on WGR 550, including his own Extra Point Show podcast. It's always game day in Buffalo. Sal, thank you so much for being here. We know you're a busy man. You got it, guys. Thanks for having yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. You. Sal just got off of uh, his show on WGR. And normally what we do, Sal, is we get into, uh, you know, your football journey and, you know, kind of your career. But we're going to change it up a little bit today and uh, get let people get to know, you know, kind of a little bit of the lighter side of you. And we're going to uh, start with our opening drive, which is 10 uh, quick questions in mm -hmm. two minutes or less, hopefully. Oh. And uh, just to kind of get an idea of, uh, of where you're coming from. So down yeah. fire away. We, we call it the two-minute warning, but we're even changing the name just for you today to the opening drive so it's like okay, scripted the plays right you have the scripted plays you're gonna exactly right. it always <laughs> always works the best except you didn't know about this for the record that's right uh the best road sideline in the nfl so Ooh, um best road sideline uh jeez mm, see so you guys have put me on the spot pretty quickly here yeah. um i will say jets still pretty close to the action you got some fans behind you you can interact with as well right three there. three people dead or alive that you'd want to have dinner with Three people dead or alive I'd want to have dinner with. Um, I'm a big U2 fan. I'd say Bono, you know, from Bono, from U2. Um, geez, I don't want to get emotional, but my father, who passed away when I was 19 years old, eight, you know, I um, think that would be one. I'd like to kind of catch up on some things. Sure. Tell what's going on in life. And who else would I love to have dinner with? Um, I don't know. i got to kind of go off the beaten path here. And so maybe an athlete I would throw in there. Um, dinner life. How about Babe Ruth? He'd be cool to have dinner with. Babe would have. There you go. Babe would order really cool stuff, and we'd have some good stories. <laughs> Two or three <laughs> steaks for sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're entering an arena. You're a big deal. There's dry ice. What is your entrance song? Um, thought about this. Like walk up music, entrance song, things like that. I've thought about this. So I would say, hmm, big arena. What's 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 the what what am I doing? Am I fighting? Like <laughs> <laughs> you are uh yeah, you're fighting. You're an MMA fighter. Yeah, you're competing for sure. MMA fighter. Um, all right, something from Iron Maiden. Like Beautiful. uh yeah, the trooper, the trooper. There you go. I like it. Uh what's the best concert you've ever been to? That's a good question. Um which I, I just said I've seen you two five times in four different cities. I think they're amazing live. Uh so I'm in Buffalo twice, Cleveland, Boston, Tampa. Um, that would, I'd, I'd say one of them, but I, I saw Bruce, Bruce Springsteen and mm -hmm. he went three hours straight, never got off the stage. It was amazing. Wow. I saw you two in 87. Bono had a broken arm. It was raining, but they brung it. They were good. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, your favorite Buffalo restaurant and dish. Um, favorite Buffalo restaurant and dish. So it's tough for me. I, you remember, know the position I'm in on radio, so I got to be careful. You know, <laughs> okay. Name I'm one sure. of the favorites. Sure. Um, no, actually, you know what? Um, I actually like. I don't endorse them at all. It's true though. I don't live far from a really good place called um, uh, Sports City Grill on Niagara Street, and I love pizza and wings, and they make really good pizza and wings. I think it's kind of a of a hidden gem. Where everybody talks about the big places and things like that. I'm a big pizza and wings guy. That's fine. But Elio's, love going to Elio's. Anything they have on the menu, you guys know you've been there. Anybody who's been involved with the Bills, they've been big Bills supporters for a long time. But Dennis and his son Elio do a great job there. We're gonna try to do a show there with Dennis. Uh, what's uh, about his wheelchair basketball? Yeah. What's your favorite cartoon growing up? Um, probably Tom and Jerry. Okay. Very good. Um, I watched, I remember, uh, Casper was a big one growing up. I like the Smurfs, probably Tom and Jerry. I think I really like them. Nice. All right. Coming back to the food. Um, the best food in the NFL, not in Buffalo on NFL city. Okay. Well, city or stadium, um, just like city mm. to go out in either one. Good question. Cause Mark gone talked about the press box, but yeah. Okay. So I'll say city then to go yeah. out. I mean, Kansas City barbecue, right? It's just mm -hmm, amazing. Yeah. When you're in Kansas City, you go out for the barbecue. It's incredible. Yeah. I very much look forward to that. Yep, get the meat sweats, but it's all yeah. good. What's the anno <laughs> most annoying fan base in the NFL? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go back to this the sideline thing. Is the Jets? Yeah, uh, yeah. Where, uh, we, we had I mean, Henry. We had Henry Kuntu on uh, one of our first, very first episodes, and he talked about an incident that he had videoing the Bills in Ch Old Chase Stadium, and he had to actually have an armed security guard in the video booth with him. 
uh, during the game. And so they gave, they gave him a gun just to show it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let, let me amend that for a second, okay? Jets can be like the rudest. That's what it is. Like they're just they're, they can be just mean, rude people, right? I don't. I wouldn't say they're annoying. They are who they are, right? They're just going to be those people. I would say. Um, Dolphins fans might be the most annoying because they don't even go to their stadium unless they're actually a good team. Sure. Yeah. You know, I mean, they show up their fair weather and it's just annoying. And then they actually think they're really good. And they, the, that stupid song they play after they score. Oh, yeah. Like that, right? Oh, God. Yeah. There you go. Dolphins. Yeah. They stole that from the that's, Oilers. That's the, worst, that's the worst fight song in the NFL. I, <laughs> yeah. I feel they like. They did. They stole it from the Oilers, Don. Yeah. Right. See? Love your blue. Yeah. Showing my age there. But uh, okay. So the. Uh, we, got, we got two more. Two can, more. You, can you drive a stick shift? Yep. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I had to learn when I got out of college, and um, it was um, the first time I remember buying a little Toyota Paseo, I think it was called, uh, down in Florida, and I drove this little car, and I had to learn how to drive a stick, and like the first couple day or two out, I was literally getting stuck in the middle of the road, but I learned it, and I did it. I had to learn on the job, but yes, I can drive a stick. All right, last, last one here, Don. Uh, the best road hotel scene. Best road yeah hotel scene that's a good question um south beach miami there you go um i mean usually as you know like we usually stay right there on the beach mm -hmm. right and on the on the road on the on the drive this is part of it on the drive in on a1a it is just bills fans yeah. and they are partying and they're going crazy and they're welcoming the bus in ah it's crazy and then you get there and it's not it's a beach party right and people right. across the street you know it's not necessarily happening inside the hotel it's the team hotel but you're right there so that's why i say best road hotel scene is miami great gotcha. answer yeah so uh, that was fun so we're gonna we're gonna go back here you know kind of to your beginning you're you're a local guy can you kind of talk us through you know your journey to where you are now I, I know you went to syracuse university so maybe just talk us through you know the local scene did you play football were you you know involved in with local football how did you how did you get to syracuse and then you know how did you get back to buffalo so yeah i was a um I was a big I was a big athlete growing up. I was a three sport athlete. I went to Cleveland Hill High School. Grew up in Chictawaga, um, and actually was all uh, all ECIC football player and baseball player in high school. I was a Connolly Cup nominee. Okay. Uh, you know, the Connolly Cup's given to the best high school player in Western New York. Um, so you know, it's pretty obviously pretty proud of that to be able to play at that level. But I was always too small. I could never play at the next level. You know, I mean, I graduated high school at you know. Five eight buck thirty five right so yeah. it wasn't like I wasn't going out of college I I thought about going to Buff State and playing college football I probably could have played by the time my senior year came around you know but I really just wanted to be a broadcaster and you know wanted to go in and once you realize you're not going to be a professional ball player whether that's now I'm not going to play center field for the Yankees and I'm not going to be you know a wide receiver for the Bills then you know you steer in other directions and you know decided I I, I saw that all these people went to Syracuse University and you know that's where. What Bob Costas, Dick Clark, Don Cricky, Marv Albert, Dick Stockton, Ted Koppel from Nightline. Like, it, throw a dart in any media market, you're going to hit a bunch of Syracuse people, right? Big I mean, names. it's just, yeah, just the, the names are just incredible. They're the best of the best. And I believe it's the best broadcasting school in the country. So um, that's where I decided to, you know, go to school because I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. I wanted to do this for a living. I mean, I remember growing up and literally watching Sabres games and watching Bills games and turning the sound down and recording myself doing play by play nice. and then listening myself back. And it's funny. I would actually listen to sports talk radio at a young age. And I remember listening to art wander growing up mm -hmm. and I was in high school and art wander was on the air and everybody who called art wander show. He had this kind of show where it was kind of unique. People would call and they all have nicknames. I remember the people called Mr. T the Polish Prince. Ace. I do remember I, that. Oh my God. I totally so, remember that. <laughs> and I would call in and because I went to Cleveland Hill, I was the Golden Eagle. I would call in. I'd say, I'm the Golden Eagle. And I was like 17 years old, and I'd call in and give my my takes. And I would literally call in and record. You know, you had to press play record at the yep. same time yep. because yep. we're all yep. old, right? Yep. Yeah, I would I'd put a cassette in. I'd press press play record, and I'd record my call. And then I'd go back and air check myself on how I sounded on the air with Art Wander. I mean, that was <laughs> I knew what I wanted to do, right? So yeah, I was a I was an athlete growing up, and I actually played. I was a bowler. I was the only football player on the bowling team in high school as well. Okay, um, so I was a three sport athlete. Went to Syracuse, played a little club baseball at Syracuse. Actually, they didn't have a division team, so I played a little club baseball there. And thought about walking on the football team, but would have been just probably used as I mean, as a punching bag. You know, you always see the movie Rudy. I would have been even below what Rudy would have been probably <laughs> at Syracuse. These guys were so big and all that. Um, so you know, that's how I that that's what 
uh, got me to Syracuse. And, you know, once I was there, I just got really immersed in doing the radio and TV thing there. And um, the, they, they did a little bit of TV. They had a campus TV station, but mostly radio, Z89, WJPZ. It's like the, it's like one of the best college stations in the country, wins awards every year. And, and we actually were a music station, top 40. I was a DJ and I did some sports and I actually became a DJ at a local bar called Maggie's on the Hill. If anybody's listening to this and know Syracuse, it's now like some store or whatever, but it was called Maggie's on the Hill. And I was a DJ at night there. So it was a, it was a good time, obviously. Uh, too good. That's why I didn't have very good grades, but you know. <laughs> so so growing up here, you know, like I did, I think we're probably similar in age. I'm 47. And uh, the, the early 90s run from the Bills, you know, we started our podcast comparing, you know, the 1990 season to, you know, last year's teams and a lot of the similarities going into the season. Can you just kind of walk us through your memories of those teams how much that affected your childhood. I mean, those guys were my, the, the four Super Bowl years were my four high school years. So, you know, it was such a big part for anybody growing up here or people yep. who didn't grow up here and are listening now. Like it was, it was everything here. So maybe just, was that part of the reason you wanted to be a sports broadcaster? Yep. Like how much did those teams affect, you know, basically your, your, your life going forward? Yeah, amazingly. So yeah, we are close. I'll be 50 in a couple of weeks. And those Super Bowl years were three of my four college years. Which, by the way, did not go well because I had a lot of friends from New York who were Giants fans uh, when I first got at Syracuse, and they had yeah. just come off the Super Bowl twenty five loss, right? And then, oh. and then, you know, I would, I would literally, I would tell people, I'd take a Greyhound bus back as a poor college student from Syracuse to Buffalo to, you know, as a season ticket holder to go to games, you know, and and then go back to Syracuse, and somebody sat near me, actually lived in Syracuse, would drive me back and drop me off in my dorm, and that's how awesome. I spent my weekends basically during football season. And yeah, growing up, I mean, I, I, I think. Um, I was actually, I mean, this is very early. I was actually very, very early, more of like first as a Sabres fan than a Bills fan because I had some uncles that were, you know, the rock 'em, sock 'em, fighting kind of hockey fans, right? And we used to watch Sabres games all the time when I would like, my mom would drop me off at my aunt and uncle's house and I would watch hockey games while my aunt and my mom, they, they'd go to bingo or something. I'd watch the game with my uncle and became a Sabres fan. And this was when I was probably six, seven years old, you know, and then you, you get in. And I remember the first time I, first time I ever really cried after a sporting event. Nineteen eighty three, Game Seven, Brad well, Park scores. Oh my God! Game. Double overtime. The scramble in front of that. I, my very first Sabres game yeah. was actually Game Six at oh. the odd. My uncle took me to, and we beat him like. Eight to two or some some crazy score in game six. And I remember walking down those old dusty odd like yep. ramps to leave and everybody was chanting the Bruins suck. And I was like seven and I'm like, this is the greatest thing of all time. <laughs> so yeah, game seven, Brad Park, that was a wild scramble in front of the net and got, came back to the defenseman and he that's double overtime. Yeah, yeah it's uh Rick Sealing scored both goals at game savers were up, right? I mean, I remember that, but that was the first time I was I was ten years old and I bawled myself to sleep after that oh. game, right? And you gotta remember, like you guys know. For, for those who aren't as old as us, like the Bills were not good then. They were just coming out of the Chuck Knox era. They were okay. And then they got, they were bad. You know, back to back two and 14 seasons, 84, 85. And I remember being a kid and my friends, a lot of them were Cowboys fans or Steelers fans because those were the teams their parents grew up watching and they were pretty good back then. And, you know, of course you had Bills fans too as friends, but I played football. I was really like the only one of my friends growing up who really played football. I started playing football in third grade on the 65 pound team, <laughs> Cheek to Waga, Pop Warner, Cheek to Waga, Little Loop. I mean, you literally had to weigh in and you couldn't be more than 65 pounds. And I could still weigh in with all my equipment. I was not 65 pounds. Wow. That's wow. how small I was. And, but you know, I love football and you know, I, I, I watch football and I love football and I love the game and gravitate towards the bills and watch them. And you know, even going through those two and 14 years, like those were the teams I started hooking on to. And then all of a sudden, you know, 86 comes around and then you get Kelly in 86 from the USFL and then 87 is a strike year. And then 88 Thurman comes aboard and it just starts to, and now I'm in high school, I'm going into high school now. And you know, 88 is my first year in high school, basically. And, you know, the team is in my formative years getting better. So it all kind of aligned for me where the, I was getting to the age where I could really understand and respect it and be a part of it. And the Bills were getting good at the same time. And then, of course, they go to the AFC Championship game in 88 and the playoffs in 89. And I went to the Ronnie Harmon drop game in 89 in Cleveland. Mm. Daryl Talley said that's not a drop, didn't he? He defended him. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl Talley's told us that was a tougher catch than it looked like. And yeah. he, had, he had Ronnie's back on, on that. <laughs> I respect that, but yeah. it was a drop. Right? I I, yeah, it, it was, was a drop. drop. Yeah. 
I totally Don Don was you were with the team then. That was and, my second year. Eighty eight was my first year as an intern, and uh, yeah, eighty nine the bickering bills. We've had guys on to talk about that, but uh, ooh, that was that was that was tough to take. I didn't cry, but I was close. <laughs> they, they, um, I remember leaving the stadium. Well, I remember during the game actually. I'm there. My dad drove me and three of my high school friends. I was a junior in high school, so we go to the game. We drive to Cleveland, and I remember being at Old Municipal Stadium. And I'm sitting there, and I'm you know I'm this teenager, and the Bills scored and I'm going crazy. And I looked down and this guy, I mean, he was an older man. Like he was an adult. He had to be like probably thirties or forties. I should say at least. And he looked at me and he goes, sit down, you little bleeper bleeper. Like, and I mean, and my dad's there and my dad doesn't want to start a fight. Right. And he's like, sure. you know, just, just be, be cool. Right. Whatever. So I sit down. I'm like, Oh my God. And I'm kind of afraid. And that game guys, maybe the best game I've ever, I've ever been to at a live game other than up until Kansas city a couple years ago, you know, back and forth, it was incredible. So they're going back and forth. And I remember bill score again later and I jump up and I'm going and I stop myself and I look down and that guy had moved down seats because somebody must've told him, you know, you, you know, watch yourself. <laughs> we were leaving the stadium after the game. And I remember people coming up to us, ah, go home the 90. Yeah. Buffalo straight down the 90. Ah, get out of Cleveland, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, but, to answer your question, it's a long story and way of saying, like, for sure, those teams were super, super big part of my childhood growing up. And the goalposts come down when they win in 88, and I'm watching on TV. And, yeah, that was a, a big, big part. Now, look, the other thing is, I will tell you, I come from a, a divorced family, my mom and dad. Um, and those were the years where my parents separated. And I was an athlete always growing up. But I also latched onto those things, I think, as a distraction in my life, to be quite honest sure. with you. Right? I mean, yeah. like, like I, I, I always say this to people. I could tell you, and I don't think I could now, but at least at one time in my life, not too long ago, I could tell you the last 25 Heisman Trophy winners, 25 Super Bowl winners, you know, Stanley Cup winners and all that. You know what I know about a car? Where to stick a key. Like sports <laughs> my thing growing up. Like that's, yep. that, that's what I did. And I'd watch sports and I was a part of sports and I was always busy with sports, watching, playing, reading, whatever it was. Yeah. But for the record, you can drive a stick shift. And I have a <laughs> yes. couple follow-up questions for you. Yes. Chris, Chris Brown went to Syracuse, right? I don't think Chris went to Syracuse. Oh, I missed that. Did he go to UB? Okay, I was thinking. So, I don't know where Chris went. No, I maybe downstate even. I don't know where Chris went. Okay, and yeah, maybe not. Uh, do you, uh, Dan Evans, the IT director, I think he went to Cleve Hill before you. Okay, so 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 the Bills. Shout out to my Cleveland Hill Eagles. I have my my eagle here. Hold on one second, guys. Hold on. Just kidding. Shout out to my Cleveland Eagles. Oh, there you and, go. Hey, <laughs> I, I, I have it proudly displaying in my room. I'm a, I'm a big Cleveland Hill Eagle. Um. Dan Evans, the IT director for the Bills, uh, yeah. vice president of the Bills IT, plus Matt Hunter, who helps run stadium operations, oh. also a Cleveland Hill guy. And I believe Dr. Tom White went to Cleveland Hill. So as small of a school as it is, we've actually uh, produced quite a few people in the NFL, I guess. Yeah, he's still my doctor. Uh, there I, you go. Actually, that reminds me, I'm a little bit late for uh, – I'm going to drop a few pounds before I get back there. He was <laughs> um, but uh, going back to the 89 game, we also had Don Beebe on, and he said, of course, one of the famous plays is him yeah. – landing like a pogo stick on his head. He, he came back in the game, but he said if they played the next week, there's no way he could have played. He was sore for months after that play, uh, you know, his spine. Another thing, too. Also um, a break in that play because it should have been it should have been Brown's ball. Ball never hit the ground. Ooh, that's yeah. right. Yep. That's right. There was no replay. They called it an incomplete pass. There's no reason to. It never hit the ground. Oh, yeah. That was a strange play. So, yep. um Go, so now you're with the Bills, and, and something I have a kind of a, a personal experience with you, uh, having traveled with the team. Uh, again, going back to the introduction of you, Sal, you, you're so uh, trusted. I know you're a humble guy, but just accept this from us. Uh, but one of the things I really admired, because I know it's difficult, is when you are traveling with the team, as you do, there, there's a certain way that you just have to conduct yourself. You're in a unique role. Josh was asking me before the program here. Are, are you the only non-paid Bills employee on the plane? Um, no, I'm the only non-paid like report like by the Bills. Just, by so, the bills. No, 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 no. So, so right. uh, let me rephrase that. I'm sorry. I want to say no because our two engineers also fly. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, right, yes, right. Like, 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 you know what I mean. So I'm not the yep. only one. Sure. Um, how do you navigate? Like, what are the challenges in, in navigating it? Because I'll, I'll say you you do it really well. Okay, so first of all, let me say, I grew up a Bills fan, okay? Like, I want to see this team succeed. I get all the stuff about, if you're going to be in this business, leave your fandom at the door, you got to be objective, all that kind of stuff. Whatever. We live in a, if people want to say, if people say like, oh, well, you know how much I get, like you're such a home or all that kind of stuff. People say that all the time. Look, I'll, 
I'll freely admit, I want the Buffalo Bills to win. I want all Buffalo sports teams to win. I am a champion for Buffalo. I want Buffalo to do well. So you start with that starting point, which is I'm not looking to just tear everything down and go in there and burn everybody and be Mr. Oh my God, go fire this person, trade that guy. This person sucks. I'm just not that guy. It's not my nature. And I'm also just an optimistic person. So that's just not me. So I think that part of it fits. The other part is like, I, we have a business relationship with them, right? I mean, we are the radio rights holder. It does nobody any good for all of us to be speak button heads and mad at each other. And, oh my God, why'd you say this? Why'd you say that? Why'd you do this thing? And then to give the bills credit ever since I've, I've been on the sidelines and this goes back. Mark Honan was a, a great resource for me when he was there. Uh, Mark's a great guy. And two o'clock today, his episode gets, yeah, yeah, we I don't want to timestamp this episode, but we, we he, was, he was excellent interview. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mark, Mark would always tell me when, when I was on the sidelines my first several years, if we stink, say we stink. Like when you're reporting, if we do something wrong, say we do, we just want you to be fair. Just be fair. Don't take cheap shots. Right. And that's always something that stuck with me, which is, that's right. Don't take cheap shots. I'm not that guy anyway. So I think I fit the role because it's nothing I have to do any different the way I normally would be, if that makes sense. Right. If there was somebody else there, they might have to change their complete style. I don't have to change my complete style. Um, it is the only thing that really sometimes gets challenging is like, I do see things, know things, hear things. I can't report things because mm. I'm on the plane. Like that's just not, that's a no, no, you can't do that. And I totally respect that. But I get a lot from people who follow me or listen to me. How come you never break news? How come you don't? Like, I know a lot of things. I just can't say it. You know what I mean? Like, I see things. I hear things. Stuff like that. Because it's just part of the job is you're privy to this stuff because you're in that position. So you can't necessarily do that. You know? And, and, and I think that's the only thing sometimes that it gets a little frustrating. But covering the team, reporting on the team, I mean, I'm super lucky. I get to travel with an NFL team and be on an NFL sideline. And I I... I Anything that ha I have to walk a line for is totally is is worth that trade off. Sure, absolutely. You know, when, when I when I worked for the team and and I got to go on the plane and and I think I think Don might have felt this way too. And I was going to ask you, do you feel like you get a good read before a game as to how the team's going to play? Because for for <laughs> for my for my time there, I felt like at times you kind of felt like you knew what was coming, when, mm. especially when you're going on the road. Uh, do, have, do you feel that way that you can, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, "Hey, you know, how are they going to play?" Not not whether they're going to win or lose, because there's so much variation, et cetera. But do you do you get the do you get the uh, kind of a a general feeling before the game of how the team's going to play? I like to think I do, but then I'm kind of proven wrong a lot, right? Okay. So, like, um, there's been times where I would say, like, "Oh yeah, man, they're dialed in, they're ready for this game," and then they just don't play like that. Right? They come out and you don't. And there's been times where I'm like. Man, I don't know, man. I just know it's this team. Like it just seems like there's just not a lot of energy, and then bam, you know, they just go out there and 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 go and do it. So I do think though, when you're around the 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 team and you get more of a general sense of, and it's not necessarily before the game. I think as the game is going, I think as the game as it starts. I remember specifically like the awful loss a couple years ago in Jacksonville. Like that one sticks out to me. Like from the beginning, I'm like, has not much energy down here. I remember saying on the sidelines, yeah, like. Just seems like they need a little more juice and you just never got it that day, right? You never, you never had it. Um, you know, they come out against the Patriots in the wild card game and just blow the doors off the Patriots. Like right away, that first drive, I'm like, oh my God, like this team is into it. Like it's going to be tough to beat this team this day. Like you can feel it a lot of times right away when that's happening. But otherwise, I think everything surrounding the game and leading up, it's really more of a business thing where you just never know. They're just going about their business and you can't really figure out necessarily how it's going to go that day. Yeah, I would I would agree. It's hard to there's there's very little variation in how the team conducts themselves on the on the plane. Right. <clears throat> it's very like you said, very business like. Um, there's a lot of nerves. It's it's quiet. Uh, I will say there's a difference, and and you know this too, and you Sal. Uh, there's, there's a difference after the game after a win. <laughs> Just to, yeah. you sure. feel you, if if you know in a loss, you feel like you don't even want to lean over and talk to the guy, uh, and certainly not on the bus or or even across the aisle from you but after a win it's like you know guys three aisles three seats yeah. back from me hey what are you? <laughs> uh it just it feels like you have that license to do like you've earned it and i'd also say this don like you you've experienced this it also depends who's in charge like true a, a rex ryan trip is different than a sean mcdermott trip right i mean it's just the way it goes <laughs> i mean right yeah. and, and 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 we've all got different than a doug marone trip right yeah. i mean there's just there's everybody the people who are in charge the way they the way they seat 
people on the plane, you know, the, the dress code on the plane, the, like the, the time that you go and arrive somewhere and the different kind of, you know, responsibilities people have. I think all of that changes throughout, what, depending on who's running the team. Yeah, with Doug Marone, I don't think I've ever seen an icier stare that when he thought he was very clear about telling the players, you know, he had just come from Syracuse and wanted yep. that college way, that they had to wear a suit. And when a few guys didn't, Holy cow. He, he just like fire came out of his eyes, <clears throat> you know, and uh, Paul Lancaster was a director of player engagement. He was six, seven. So he brought a couple extra jackets with him. So at least uh, they had a jacket uh, for a but, player. That's yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I, funny I remember yeah. Doug Marone. One of the things that stands out to about Doug Marone's trips were like, he said, anybody who went like on the trip on the plane, even the media, who's not, you know, part of the team, like we could not be at the hotel bar at all. Like even hang mm -hmm. out and just to, to say hello. We, we right. couldn't do that. Like, that's not normally the case with most coaches I've been with. And that's okay. Like, whatever his rules are, I totally respect. I get it. But it always stood out to me. Like, you couldn't even hang out there, even if you're having a club soda. Mm. Yeah, it's just, it's for the appearance of it. I, I'm just having right. a flashback, too. I remember, uh, regarding you, last time, one of the last trips I might have been on with you was 2016 in London. And I was on the last bus, and you went over early. And you, you had been there several days, too, right? And I think yeah. you texted me that, you left something behind in the lobby for your son. Do you remember that? And I might have. My son was very young and he was in London with my wife on okay. that trip. Like they came over separately, but stayed in my hotel with me. Okay. And as you texted me, I saw it. Oh yeah, there it is. And I, 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 you know, threw it in my bag. And when I saw you, I gave it to you and you were so appreciative. Like, uh, yeah, just, but, uh, you're just a, a very uh, thoughtful guy. Do you, do you, do you sell like when you're, when you're on the road, what what I, I think people might be interested. What what do you do once the plane lands up until you know game time? C could you just kind of quickly walk us through what your schedule is? Because uh, I, I know people are always interested in like the behind the scenes yeah, stuff sure. of you know what, what what do you do you know from the time the plane lands on Saturday till kickoff on Sunday? Okay, so that can always change depending on certain things. So I'll give you an example. Like um, went to L.A. last year and I actually had I hosted a like Bills fan party basically uh the bills fan club the south la bills chapter uh bills fans like i had a party to go to that i was a big part of that night you know getting in town and all that on wednesday so i went there you know for that um if i remember right i mean actually i think i might have flown over separate because i went with my family but the point is the night that that was something i had to do that night i had to go there right so sometimes there might be an obligation i have to go there and be a part of like oh hey there's this big bills fan party and i'll hey i'll come by i'll do a podcast like this or something like that at some place and i'll do that but generally speaking if there's no things like that um so we usually get into the city we're going at around 3 30 4 o'clock you get to your hotel 4 4 30 somewhere around there maybe a little earlier depending um once that happens um, preseason, if you on a preseason game, by the way, I have a production meeting with Sean McDermott because we go through like the roster and who might play, so we can kind of be aware of that. We don't get that on radio regular season, only the network TV gets that. Um, during the regular season, you know, they pay a lot of money to have those rights to have sure. those, you know, kind of meetings, so they do that. Uh, so regular season, I get there, I go to my room, I basically just kind of get set, I Start writing my article, for like preview article, because by then, you know, it's, I don't want to wait too long. I want to get more information about the game. It's kind of a, you know, keys to the game, things like that. I probably don't want to finish it completely. It might be something I think of before then, but I'll start writing the article. But then I'll start basically getting ready to go out to dinner, uh, meeting people. I meet, you know, other media members who are already there. Uh, we'll go out and we'll meet somewhere. Some people have gone on, you know, the media plane, like Bill Whippert and I, we go out sometimes, you know, photographer, great, does a great job. You know, we'll go out and eat somewhere or something like that. Um, Murph. You know, people like the engineers that, you know, come with us, Greg Harvey and Todd Brody, start texting them, you know, you want to meet in the lobby at a certain time, go down there, go out to dinner, um, go out to dinner, have a nice dinner, come back and hang out maybe by the bar and have a glass of wine, right? If, if that's sure. allowed, right? we could do yeah. that, um, but hang out in the hotel a little bit and do things like that. It's not really a big, you know, we're only there for a little while and you got to be, you're, you're with an NFL team. You have to conduct yourself properly, right? You don't, I don't ever want to put myself in a position where I'm going to have somebody say, why did Sal Capaccio do this? So I can't believe anything like that. Like, I never want to be that. That's not my role. Um, so generally, I think to answer your question is kind of low key, but I meet friends out and I go out for dinner and it's a chance for me to catch up. There might be some college friends in New York City that I haven't seen in a while. Mm -hmm. Tell them where we're staying. I'll take I'll take the train. And now look, if there's a, if there's a, you know, early in the season, big Sabres game on or basketball game on, could go and watch that somewhere. What if it's in that city? One year, Whip and I, Bill Whippert, Went to the see the Jets, 
we landed, and that night we went to see Billy Joel at Madison Square Garden. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's perfect. Right? He was playing. So we yeah. took the trade in. Went to So anything like that that's going on, those are always opportunities for me that I normally wouldn't be able to do that I take advantage of. Yeah, I caught, uh, in 2009, I caught the Ace ALCS Game 2 against the Angels. Oh, the I love it. Stadium. <laughs> Sorry, Josh. No, anyway, I, I don't mean to. Don, Don's, Don, Don and I know you, Sal, are, are Yankee yeah. fans. And, and my dad my dad was born in New Hampshire, so I, I got the right side of history to being a Red Sox fan. Uh, oh. Don and I went up to St. Louis Arch together in 2000 before a oh, preseason yeah. game. Oh. I, I remember that. Have you ever, have you ever was, done that? That was tight. No, no, but I remember uh, two years ago, my first trip, ever to Wrigley came because of Bill's preseason game. We were there and there was about 20 of us in the media. We all went to Wrigley. It was great. We sat in the bleachers, went to a, a Cubs game. You know, the, the Bills were playing the Bears uh, the next day. So we did that. And then as far as, um, you know, the next day, as long as the team's playing at one o'clock, right? I mean, you could have a little more time. They're not, you know, you get to bed, you wake up the next morning and um, I, I basically turn on NFL Network or ESPN, get the latest news around the league, who's doing what. And um, it's the only... You know, I don't iron a lot at home, but I iron like when yeah. I get up in the morning. I iron my clothes and my yeah, I iron my clothes and get ready for um, you know, my my collared shirt and my pants. And I get get ready and I have to go downstairs to you know meet might might eat, might meet for some breakfast a little bit, but usually just wait, go downstairs, meet in the lobby, get your bags, check it on that bus, and get to the stadium by nine a.m. and it's time for radio. Yep. Sal, this has been, I know there's many demands on your time. I just want to leave you with a couple things. You mentioned John Murphy before. Yeah. Um, have you heard anything from, from John? Any updates? I did text John the other day and um, he texted me back just to say he's doing better. And uh, thanks wow. for the text. So, you know, I, I, we all, we all, um, we're all hoping John recovers very, very quickly and we can get him back on the air as soon as possible, obviously. Yeah. I, that's, that's great news. I wanted to ask you maybe one fun question before we left. Can you give me a good Either plane story, obviously without naming names, plane story, hotel story, sideline story, uh, stadium story of a player or a coach, something that you just remember that's either funny or light, you know, that because because we've told a bunch of stories on this show and, and people seem to really enjoy some of our behind the scenes stories. You got something that you could share with us that, that stands out from your years of traveling? Um, years of traveling. I said, Ooh, cause my, my best sideline story is a home story. I oh, sure. do that then. <laughs> okay. my, my best sideline story is a home story. And that is the fight between the Jags and the bills a few years ago. And there's a play at the goal line. I'm standing there. I always stand right at the goal line and there's some mm -hmm. back and forth and some pushing and shoving. And you guys know this, but in case people don't know, like literally that is maybe where the goal line is to the to the stands might be the smallest area in the league mm -hmm. for any stadium. Yeah. Like there's not a lot of room there, right? It's really tight. And so, you're, so I'm, and then you have the, the camera behind you on that big thing, the truck that moves basically the, the big uh, movie, movable camera thing. Uh, and there's not a lot, a lot of places to go. So there's not a lot of room there, but in the meantime, I'm watching this and I'm backing up because I'm like, okay, this is getting a little heavy. Here comes Leonard Fournette from the other side. Here oh, comes Shaq cool. Lawson. And all of a sudden, all heck breaks loose and I'm in the middle and I get slammed basically into the wall. Like I'm in the fight. I get hit into the wall. They didn't mean to hit me. Right. Sure. And I remember just hightailing it out of there and watching this fight. And I'm like, Oh my God, I was in this fight. And I go back and I watch the CBS broadcast and there's me against the wall and get out of there. It was amazing. <laughs> and then this year, the same thing kind of happened with the bills against the dolphins. And Josh goes down by the sideline and Josh gets hit and everybody starts pouring in. I'm doing the same thing. And then this one, this is where it becomes like, okay, I didn't want to do anything wrong, but like Josh is laying and he's looking up and he kind of looks at me to help him up. And I'm thinking, I'm in my brain, I have to make a decision in a millisecond. Is it proper for me as the sideline reporter to help Josh Allen up? <laughs> Hell yeah, it's Josh Allen, I'm helping him up. Of course up. it is. Of course it is. <laughs> I, got yeah. a, I got a feeling which way you, you balance. Yeah, right. yeah, I, know, you know, I did. So I helped Josh up. Because, awesome. you know, he was just looking up like you, you, you have to you have to board the plane the next week with him, right? You better help him up. <laughs> I, no, that's I, right. So it was it was pretty incredible. So two fights I've been in right at that same side. That's amazing. Right? That's awesome. Yeah, that's a tough corner. So if it happens again. Uh, I I don't know if the Bills would want you to know this, but if you're in an official capacity, which you are, if you happen to get injured, I hope it doesn't happen, it would be a workers' comp case. <laughs> there you go. Oh, that. I love it. I love it. There you go. There's, there's the old, there's the old, what happened, but yeah. there's the old director of football administration they have coverage. coming out. <laughs> they have coverage. Don't worry. It won't cost them much. We're, 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 we're going to see sales creeping up towards the uh, towards the sideline on any goal line play the next few years, and we'll know yeah. why. It is my. It is. It is really, though. It is seriously one of my biggest fears. Mm -hmm. to i don't want to be like espn oh 
Bill's sideline reporter does whatever, whatever during a game. And like, you become a story, right? Yeah. Like, I'm like, that's why I literally didn't even know. Should I help Josh up? Is that proper? And I'm like, I mean, Josh Allen's looking at me. He wants me to help him up. But you, yeah, you got, I, would, you, I would do it for anybody. Right. I mean, but you, you, those are the things that go through your brain at the time. I remember a few years ago, Cleveland Brown sideline reporter yelled at the official during a game about a call and got booted out of the game. Wow. Yeah, that's that's outside. Was, of was your that purview. was that their, was yeah. that their last was that their last game as the Cleveland Brown sideline? No, they reporter? came back. They became oh, the wow. I I I I don't remember who it was specifically. I don't think he's on sidelines anymore, but he's still on broadcast. I think, but but it wasn't because of that. They just changed things around. But he came back and still had the job. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Sal. That's we awesome. really appreciate it. it. Was it was it was a lot of fun. You know, we're we're doing a bunch of interviews and, and stories from you know players, coaches, and staff, and, and getting kind of like an oral history of, of the Bills together here. You know, maybe for a larger project down the road. And we really appreciate your time and and you know joining us today. Can't wait for people to hear this. Yeah, Sal, great yeah, seeing and, you. Thank uh, you. Any you too, guys. And anytime you need any help on that, any stories, whatever I can help in, just always feel free to reach. Yeah, out. maybe we'd love to have you. You know, maybe come on during the season as well and yeah. talk. Maybe a little bit of current bills. We we try to you know let the other cover one guys. You know, they do a, a better job than than us on on the current stuff. But we uh, we're always here for you know stories and memories and, and good times. Awesome. Yeah, for sure, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Sal. Take care. Appreciate okay, it. You too. That was that was a lot of fun, Don. Sales exactly, uh, you know who he is on the radio, and and that didn't surprise me. What a great interview and storyteller he is. Yeah, nice job uh, arranging for him. I he's been on my radar for a long time, but I know how busy he is, so I was really encouraged. I think he commented once months back about something about he liked the content of our show, but uh, I, I love the fact that that came together and yeah, Buffalo just, guy. Yeah, you know, easy easy to root for, and uh, it's always nice that it, it to me it feels nice when a guy who's covering the team grew up here you know it, like, it means more it just it, you know it just means more yeah. to, to, to people who grew up here with went through the 90s you know like he so said and it's funny that i was gonna stop him when he said the first time he ever yeah. cried uh, at a sporting event i knew he was gonna say 1983 game seven brad park double overtime it was the second round of the playoffs and it was probably the, it was the worst loss for me as a fan until the Ronnie Harmon game. Well, it was interesting too, because he had just mentioned Super Bowl 25. Yeah. So I just assumed it was going to yeah, be Yeah, no, that, I knew, right? I knew, <laughs> I, I almost stopped him and yeah. I said, Brad Park, right? And it was just, <laughs> it was round two and it was just, it was, it was the Bruins who had the Sabres number for years and years and years. And it was, it was a devastating loss to my seven-year-old psyche. Uh, <laughs> before, yeah. before, uh, before we go, get a couple announcements. Uh, we're going to have uh, Mark gone uh, from the Buffalo News mm -hmm. on tomorrow. And, uh, you know, Don uh, was able to reach out and we're going to have John Fina on next mm -hmm. week and maybe one or two other guests. Oh, yeah. Before we do leave, of course, we do have to uh, spin the wheel of failed Bills coaches. Uh, to remind everybody, Don was the director of football administration for 13 years and the Bills made the playoffs exactly zero times. So these are not failed coaches. They are failed <laughs> Bills coaches. Today, Don, the wheel spin on Tyke Tolbert. Tyke Tolbert. Uh he was a receivers coach. Um, most of the uh, coaches, when they come in, they live in Orchard Park is like plan A because it's so close. Uh, and they like to, you know, um, they get told by Bowl oh, Orchard Park. Uh, and or it's Williamsville. They have a little commute, but they like it there. We get some. We West Seneca has some too, but for um, – it, it's a good school district. I say that because my, my wife and daughter teach there, but he lived in West Seneca. And I remember his kids went to uh, uh, West Seneca elementary. Okay. And uh, they, they were just real nice. My wife was, was oh, Amy yeah. their teacher? No, but she was in the building. Okay. Yeah. And she just said, Oh, they were so well behaved. And okay. uh, I Tyke's a good guy, a uh, real personal guy. I think he went on to win. Was he on that? He might've been on that Denver team when Peyton Manning was there. Someone can look this up and won a Super Bowl ring, I think. Okay. Um, but I just remember him being a real gentleman. And uh, I, first thing that comes to mind was the fact that his kids went to the school where uh, my wife was teaching. Wade Phillips, when he lived here, he lived in Williamsville, which right? I thought was really interesting. Yeah. And I, I ended up going. What's get, get this. I'm, sure. Go ahead. Finish. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay. We had one player in early 2000s, Chidi Ahana. Yeah. All right. Yeah. He, Josh, he lived in Toronto. Really? And took a limo back and forth every, every single day. day. Was he, why? I, I, he just, he was one of those international cultural type guys that had always a heard limo. about Toronto. Every day? Every day. 
every, every day. It, with, <laughs> How I, much did that cost? Oh, I can't imagine. I mean, I've, clearly I, he was – was he here one year, two years? I think one year. Well, is that's a choice to live in year. Toronto. He had like seven sacks or something. I mean, he was like wow. a decent, solid defensive lineman. But, yeah, Toronto. <laughs> Not, not Hamilton, like all the way up in Toronto. Like So two-hour round trip each way, best case from Orchard Park. Best, best, best case. case. You know, who knows what the bridge is like, right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, he, the, uh, Tyke Tolbert was with the Bills from 2004 through 2009. Okay. So, so quite a bit of time. And you're right. He was with the Broncos from 2011 through 2017. Okay. And so he, he would have caught that that Broncos Super Bowl team in okay. 20, 2013. Wade was on that that staff as well. Oh, he that's was, right. He was a coordinator. But yeah, so, so funny story. He lived in Williamsville. And <laughs> I don't think I've told this on the, on the podcast before we go. And uh, he wanted to watch a preseason Bears game. And this was back in the day with DirecTV where you could get the cards that were like jailbroken, mm-hmm. where you had a guy who would be able to get you all the channels on DirecTV. And this was like, you know, pre-streaming, obviously, all that. So there was no way to get an out-of-market NFL preseason game. You mm-hmm. couldn't you couldn't watch it because there was no NFL network and they weren't they just weren't broadcasting them all. Well, me trying to make uh, an, an impression and trying to impress the head coach made the mistake of telling him that I had the jailbroken direct TV card. <laughs> so I could take my direct TV box and I could watch anything. I mean literally anything. So I said that to him kind of in passing. I'm like, oh yeah, I got the the, the the thing, you know, if you if you want to watch the game, thinking nothing of it. This was like Monday or Tuesday of that right. week. Right. It comes up to me the morning of the preseason game. It might have been, a th- I think it was a Friday because we had played the night before, something like that. And he goes, hey, yeah, you know, um, I, I still want, kind of want to watch that game. Can you make that happen for me? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. And, and Why did I say Why it? did I say that? <laughs> so I ended up, long story short, I ended up going over to Wade's house. Yep. I brought not only the the direct TV card that went in the box, but I brought the whole entire unit <laughs> just to be safe. I got there three hours in advance. I made sure everything was set up properly on his TV because those jailbreak cards could get zapped at any time and you mm. lose everything because they were not you know technically legal. So he was very gracious. Uh, at the time, I brought my girlfriend over with me, and I remember he ordered pizza, pizza and wings. And he had a bunch of other people. So the other, the worst part was he started inviting other coaches over to come watch the game too. <laughs> so now I'm on the hook for like Carl Monk was there. Hey, this better not screw up, kid. You know, and so I'm sweat. I did not enjoy myself at all because the whole game I'm just thinking something's gonna happen. The game's gonna go out, and all these guys are gonna be pissed off at me. But I'll never forget. I, I he ordered pizza and wings. He he lived in a in a random you know house in Williamsville. And the kid came to the door and was just shocked to see Wade Phillips answer the door. Yeah, right. You know, it yeah. was just because there was no DoorDash back then. You didn't have a name attached to the that's order. Right. So, so that's yeah, that that's wow. I that's a good memory. Yeah. Good memory. Real good. So we'll uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow uh, for for Mark gone, and then uh, next week we'll we'll uh, do some more. Sounds good.